Hi, and welcome to the Jocelyn Drake Show. I am your host, Jocelyn Drake. I thank you so much for tuning in. Today, we have a very informative show. You know, with COVID-19 uh, disrupting our lives, we have what's called a new normal. Our children are now at home with us, and, and we are learning to be teachers today. I have a guest with us, Dr. Douglas Raglan. He is the board member of the Birmingham City School System, and he's here today to kind of help us understand and to navigate this new normal in our lives. Help me welcome to the Jocelyn Drake Show, Dr. Douglas Raglan. Thank you so much, Ms. Drake. It's just a blessing to be here with you as always. We really appreciate you taking the time out of your busy schedule to share with us um, just what's going on and to help us to know what to be prepared for uh, later on as the months progress along. So tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, um, of course, I am... Um, Doug Raglan, the board representative for District 1, um, the largest district in Jefferson County. And um, I've served on the board. This is going on my third year, and I'm just so thankful for my constituents uh, having confidence to put me in office. Uh, I am a retired school superintendent. Um, of course, I've been in education for over 34 years. Um, obviously live in Birmingham and born and raised in Birmingham. Um, actually, I was born in Fairfield at Lord Nolan Hospital, but then again, I moved to Birmingham when I was two years old and been, been here ever since. Um, certainly, I'm a um, graduate of UAB and got my doctorate in educational leadership and uh, just been blessed to not only attend the Birmingham public school system, but to um, work in the system as a teacher, a um, classroom teacher for many years and then as an administrator at central office in personnel and human resources and of course uh, went on to be superintendent in two different school systems in the state of Alabama mm -hmm. uh, in Greene County and Midfield is where I retired and of course I'm serving on the board now in my capacity and just very active in my community and just just blessed to be able to serve that's that's what it's all about and of course I would be remiss if I didn't say that um, I'm married uh, to my beautiful wife, who's a pastor. And we have uh, two uh, debt-free ministries, churches in this location in Jefferson County. So we're just uh, we're giving God the glory, and I'm just a servant, and um, just want to be here to do the best I can, and not only serve in our community, but making sure I give our parents the most information necessary for them to be successful with their children. Awesome. As we can see, Dr. Raglan is extremely um, knowledgeable. He has an extensive resume in reference to dealing with our children. And so he is the perfect person to have during this season and to talk to us. You know, Dr. Raglan, when COVID began to disrupt our lives, uh, you all were forced to make some decisions that you were uh you probably took you by surprise and I'm sure that you all had to a lot of conversations, getting a lot of research, a lot of knowledge uh, on deciding to send the kids home. So can you kind of help us with what that process looked like? Yes, ma'am. Uh, certainly you're absolutely right. It took us all by surprise. And um, certainly we, we started, uh, it was right before spring break. We had to make some major decisions and we started uh, spring break a little earlier for our children and we had scheduled for them to come back uh, April 6th, of course, looking at all of the dynamics that were going on. And of course it didn't work out that way and the state superintendent intervened and, um, and just told us that we would not um, go back to school on the 6th and I think it was extended to the 30th and then eventually he came out and said that it was going to be for the rest of the year. Mm -hmm. So as a result, we had to meet uh, at least the superintendent and um, her leadership team as well as uh, board members were on the calls as well in some instances where we had to learn about the plans and what we need to do for our children and getting them prepared for this, uh, this school year that has been disrupted. Um, basically, what the district had to come up with was um, a plan, um, remote learning plan is what we came up with, where we gave our parents the option to um, online learning strictly or to go buy packages and pick up packages at the schools, which would be the school work and so forth. And, or it could be a blended form of that, which would be online and paper. And so um, certainly we, um, we allow schools to, to choose the method they want to use, and that's what they're doing. And uh, at this point, we're trying to focus in on making sure that we hit the critical skills that are necessary, because when all of this occurred, this was the third nine weeks, and when all of this occurred, we want to make sure that 
all those students that were passing, of course, the third nine weeks, K-5 as well as high school, uh, would obviously be promoted on to the next grade if they were passing and, and, and would graduate if they were high school and so forth. And so we just want to make sure we cover those skills as well as give them the enrichment so they can be prepared to be even better when they come back to school, hopefully in the, uh, in the fall. Awesome. Can you tell me, did it come from the state level, the decision that you made? Is it uh, the statewide as far as remote learning or is, was it uh, based upon city or county in reference to how you laid out your plan? It's a very good question. Every, every school system had the option to uh, submit a plan to the state and whatever would work for us because many school districts, um, I guess in your rural areas, maybe the Black Belt and so forth, uh, may not have the access to internet for children and so forth as we would have here in Birmingham and some other areas. So we had to submit that plan. So we chose to do the remote plan with those three options I mentioned, um, online, paper, or blended, online and paper. Mm -hmm. And so it was our choice and that had to be submitted to the um, the state superintendent uh, for approval. And of course, um, we should be finished with the process. Uh, our school year is gonna end with everything June 5th. And so um, that's what we're working on. And we're making sure that we're getting packages out to the schools for those children that may not have internet and so forth. And um, absolutely making sure that everybody is involved in this process from teachers to the central office team and our parents. And, 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 and of course, when they go to the schools to pick these packages up, uh, we're trying to make sure that process is as smooth as possible as well. And no more than eight people can be in a building at the school. So usually the principal coordinates that along with the um, assistant principal if he or she has one or the custodian is there to make sure things are sanitized and so forth to keep people safe. So how are you making sure that every child has either or or both? Is there some, how, what is the system in making sure that everyone knows this is our process, this is what you're to do, you can either do remotely, paper, or you can do both? It's, it's something that's communicated with um, principals, uh, by principals, with, the, uh, with their um, parents and, and um, stakeholders and so forth. Uh, primarily, uh, everything is on our website uh, as far as what we can do, the resources and so forth. And then the school system will send out links. And of course, principals will send out through their communication systems to their parents to let them know what we're doing. Um, basically, um, all schools are doing different things um, according to what would fit their particular population or their, their particular situation. But uh, the bottom line is that they're all communicating and we're letting parents know if they're doing the paper option, for example, uh, there's a communication link that goes out to everyone regarding when the pickup points will be and so forth. I think we have gotten all the paper packages to the schools um, for the past few weeks. Uh, that started April 3rd or April 6th, somewhere in that range. And I think April 27th, we will get the next round out to all the parents of the schools and that will last for the rest of the school year. But primarily it's via website, uh, via um, telephone calling, uh, the school systems using their um, phone systems and so forth to connect with parents, to let them know this is what we're doing. This is when the packages are available for pickup or this is what we're doing online and so forth because teachers have various methodologies of reaching our children, whether it be online with Zoom, just like we're doing here, or whether it be with the paper model and parents get email notifications as well to let them know what's going on with not only homework assignments and so forth, but the pickup points as well. Okay. I have a gazillion questions <laughs> from what you said. Um, okay. So, okay. I, hopefully I don't forget them. I should have jotted them down. That's okay. Um, so the parents, um, how do you think that they're adjusting to having to now teach? And how do you think the kids are adjusting to the fact that they have this newfound freedom <laughs> to uh, <laughs> learn at home? How do you think that's going? Do you really, do you think that they're getting it or help us understand the remote model? Are there teachers online that are teaching these different uh, courses or how, how, what does that look like? Yes. Um, the teachers are teaching the courses um, online based on the packages that are developed that have, they had input in developing and most of them as far as the skills that are necessary to teach for their respective grades. And of course, if they're doing Zoom or however they're doing it online, um, 
I think, um, for example, at Sun Valley Elementary School, I know they're doing um, a package that's called, I think it's Dojo, um, and we have the Clever uh, learning platform as well in the school system. But primarily what happens is um, the, the teachers uh, will have a certain amount of students that they will bring in for Zoom, then they'll bring in some more for Zoom, and parents will be there to listen or to assist or whatever and the principals can zoom in as well to observe what's going on but it's primarily focusing on the necessary skills as well as enrichment for our students to go further beyond what we give them because we have links on the website um, that will allow them to go beyond where they are and so it's a it's a combination where it's definitely you make a great point it's definitely an adjustment for for the parents to have to be there to make sure that the students are understanding and participating and the students want to make sure that they're pleasing their parents. Um, and so it's, um, and the teacher certainly wants to be there to make sure she's clear. I should say he or she is clear in the instructional aspect as well. And uh, it's, it's, it's a new normal. And it's, 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 a, it's, it's obviously uh, forced us to, to go to a new means of, teaching and, and communicating, but I would like to just say to the parents and I would say to everybody involved that it's bringing us closer together in terms of collaborating, in terms of working together, teacher. Basically, it's, um, it's a process where it's forced us to come closer together. And um, pretty much, um, I think when parents, whether the teachers or schools are using the clever process platform, learning platform we have, or whether they're using the class dojo, which is a free platform. Schools can use whatever they want in terms of the platforms to upload assignments and to notify parents and so forth to make sure that they understand uh, what's expected so they can help their children. And then uh, these assignments are obviously uh, graded and um, the students can still check their work and check their grades and so forth. And parents can as well. So it's a, it's a combination of just a different way of learning, but at the same time, I think it's going to bring us closer together. Mm -hmm. I think uh, what everybody's um, desire has been answered where you wanted the parents to get more actively involved <laughs> into their children's education. Yes. Now, COVID has forced them to do what uh, the school system has been begging them to do for years. Uh, and now, yes. um, you know, and, and it makes, makes for a better uh, it makes for a better uh, community, as you say, because it brings us closer. And I'm sure the kids are more excited to know that their parents are kind of uh, in the mix of their yes. education. Um, so um, I know it has been adjustment for the teachers as well. Um, I have a, I have about four, five nieces. They're all over Jefferson County. Yes. I have them in Vestavia, Hoover. Um, I have them in Birmingham City, and I have. Uh, Homewood. And so yeah. I noticed that they're all doing something different, as you said, it's just according to the schools, um, the reason why they are doing the things that they're doing. So the packets that you're giving them, is it a full packet that extends out for the rest of the year or will they, or is it just lasting maybe a month and then they have to pick up a new packet? That's a good question. Uh, the first packet we gave out, which I think was April 6th, um, it lasted for um, a few weeks and so forth, and uh, it's still going on right now, in fact. Uh, the next the next round will be given out, the next packages will be delivered um, April 27th, and that packet will take the students throughout the rest of the year. And as I said, the year will end June 5th for us with everything in terms of completing report cards and closing out the school year and so forth. And I think the, the district is still consulting with um, the State Department of Education in terms of how we would do summer school and so forth, because summer programs and so forth, mm -hmm. because that's something that's um, that's going to have to um, uh, be dealt with as well. Mm -hmm. Gosh, it's a lot of um, a lot of different components to get, bring forth success in this season. But I, yes. as you said, I think it's really going to help us to adjust to. Uh, something that we always had the access to, which was technology, but we were kind of stuck in doing it the old way. And now what we're finding is that technology really benefits us on so many levels. You know, there are always co 
cons, cold, they're always cons and they're always pros uh, to any situation. But I think that bringing technology in is really taking uh, education to a new level and bringing us into the 21st century. Yes. What do you think about yes. that? We um, certainly um, want to make sure that for students that even in Birmingham who may not have access to uh, technology, um, whether it be computers, Chromebooks, and so forth, we're working to try to get access for every single student, whether they can go to the schools and check them out and so forth and, and still have that option of using that online hybrid method as well as um, the paper method or whatever they feel comfortable with. And uh, we're working to try to make sure we have um, hot spots and so forth in the district, um, working with the city and so forth, so that we can make sure that technology, internet and so forth would be suitable in their respective areas where they live. So we're working on that as well, but without a doubt, the technology is, is certainly uh, the key. And, um, and I, I, I don't know, um, each of the schools uh, choices in terms of what they've chosen, but I, I know that um, um, blended learning patterns um, would be very popular with technology and paper. And of course, um, you know, the, the uh, hybrid method is what we look at in terms of having that. And of course, just using strictly paper would be something that most people would benefit from. A lot of people would benefit from as well. And we try to make sure those thick packets that were sent out uh, certainly are beneficial and they can communicate when I say they the parents and students and so forth can communicate with the teachers and principals if they have further questions regarding those packets but the technology is something that we want to get even better on than we are now awesome so we know that with technology that requires additional funds you know you all had your budget already done for the year and now COVID comes in and it's demanding more uh, from your budget um, and, and it's really dependent on the area, the school system that you're in. I know my, my niece that's in Vestavia, they just gave them Chromebooks, you know, they, <laughs> and they're just doing all, all of them, got them, checked them, you know, they got yes. the, the computers and they're at home doing what they need to do. Whereas there are other school systems who don't have that um, type of resources. So what, is there a way that maybe you could reach out or the, the school systems can reach out to some of these companies, you know, Spectrum, AT&T, uh, uh, Mac, and all of them and begin to develop partnerships so that our kids are, are, are they are, are loaded with the resources that they need because it doesn't just benefit uh, the school system, it benefits all of us. You know, they're going to need somebody at their, because their spectrum is going to need employees later on down the line, AT&T, Mac, all of them. They're going to need these kids to be well equipped to be able to be employees for them in the future. So it would be a great investment for them to come alongside of you all and make sure that every child has access to internet or to a, a laptop so that they can do their, their work. Absolutely. Um, we certainly try to reach out and, and develop partnerships. Key partnerships is something that our superintendent has been very active in doing. Mm -hmm. And I, I know Spectrum Charter um, had a, um, I guess a promotion where they actually offered uh, free internet for um, I think it was 60 days and so forth. Uh, don't know how deep we are in negotiating with them on that, but I do know that's available and I think we may have talked to them about that. As far as what you mentioned about Chromebooks and things of that nature, um, most school systems use their um, partnerships or Title I monies and so forth in, in Birmingham, we're using that, um, I think, to, to get involved in getting more technology. We have a great partnership with Apple um, in terms of technology as well. Um, we have um, been blessed to have a great reserve in Birmingham. General Fund Wines, I think we're uh, close to five months and most school systems uh, don't have that or the state requires you to have at least one month. So where we don't have title monies that may uh, be on the short end, uh, we can certainly use our general fund monies to, to get those Chromebooks and those technological uh, aids for our children. Um, but I think that that's the plan right now to look at our title one monies and so forth. And, and another interesting point, I know you didn't ask this, but certainly with the uh, COVID-19 uh, pandemic that we have, it's impacting the budget uh, at the state level and I'm sure it's gonna impact it at the federal level. And so we're going to have some shortcomings in terms of monies that, that may have uh, normally um, 
I guess that normally may come to us in, in a more uh, fluent way that may not come as much in, in terms of uh, the amount. And, um, but at the same time, that's why you have a reserve. So when you have things like uh, unexpected surprises or, uh, or pandemics of this such, uh, a proration that may come about, uh, you have to have a strong reserve to make up for that. And you have to be more, more apt to, to look at the instructional side and not so much add on personnel in the district because that's gonna create more, more monies for your, your uh, district and you don't need that at this time. But at the same time, we need to make sure we're meeting the needs of our students. And we're gonna do that with the technology and with the instruction that we offer. Okay, awesome. You know, uh, unfortunately, uh, the food, the meals that the kids get at school for some, they are the only meals that they get throughout the week is at school. So how um, are you uh, making sure that the kids are still being fed? I know it's not your responsibility uh, <laughs> when they're at home, but um, how is the community or the school system helping out uh, with that area? Well, that's, that's a very good, good question. And um, we, we have the feeding program that we're continuing and so forth. And it's with Kickstart right now. And we have negotiations in way for a, a corporate partnership to take that on as well. But I think we'll be fine for the rest of the year. Mm -hmm. um, certainly, uh, we're having different locations. Um, we started that at one point with all the schools doing it. But right now, we're limited to, we are limiting it to um, pick up points at the high school, six of the high schools, and with the exception of uh, Cara and Hudson K-8 school is going to be the pick up point in that particular area. And then I think it's spread around with different recreational centers with parents and children can come pick up the meals for the children and so forth. And so that's, I think that's working out well. And, and uh, we're going to provide that for, for the rest of the year for sure. Okay, awesome. You know, I, one uh, person, a uh, Harvard teacher was saying we could go through this with 2022. And I said, say what? <laughs> <laughs> uh, we hope not. But just in case that we're looking and it's August and September time for the kids to go back to school. Um, how, what, what are the plans? Are you looking, thinking about that? Or is it uh, something on your mind? I'm sure. I'm sure we are. Uh, obviously, we're we're looking at um, getting getting to the end of the year, which would be June fifth, in terms of everything closing for us for the regular school year. Then we're looking at terms of. Um, I guess we'll just have to work closely with the state department. They're going to pretty much call the shots there. Uh, obviously, with the governor and the state superintendent and so forth, and they'll give us our cue on how we need to proceed with that. But. Um, we're hoping to be back to some sense of normalcy, hopefully when school starts in August, but we'll just have to wait and see. Okay. Have you had any of the kids within the school system to, um, that you know of that were affected uh, by the virus? No, um, none that I know of, which is a blessing. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't have any that um, are affected by that, um, to my knowledge. And, um, I, I just um, I just encourage um, not only our children but everybody to just be safe, stay in, follow the CDC guidelines, and uh, let's just make sure that we um, do our parts in making sure that we don't um, uh, infect ourselves as well as others. Because certainly this is nothing to play with. It's dangerous. It's it's just something that's um, taking lives every single day. But at this at this juncture, I I don't see where that has affected us in that regard. Awesome. That is so good to hear and to know. Um, I want to say kudos to all of you all for um, just being able to stand up uh, and meet the challenge of the day uh, of COVID. I know that you probably could look back and say, well, we probably should have done that, you know, but it's, it's just something that no one expected to happen. And I'm sure that it, it will work out either way. Um, what are some of the plans that uh, you all are doing uh, in reference to uh, the kids, say, for instance, they didn't graduate, they didn't have their graduation, they didn't have their prom. <laughs> are there going to be any plans later on where the kids can go ahead and still walk across that stage? I know Dr. Heron, uh, our superintendent, um, had mentioned that if, if, if at all possible, um, she'd like to see um, some type of graduation for our students. And, but she said, if at all possible, and we understand that's predicated on a lot of circumstances 
and so forth. And it's just um, so heartbreaking to see so many um, events that students look forward to in the senior year, for example, like you mentioned, the proms and graduations and, um, and, and even in athletics, um, the, um, the different uh, sporting events where these seasons have been canceled and, and they won't have an opportunity to compete for championships and things of that nature. Uh, it's disappointing and it's in, in to a lot of students, I'm sure, and parents as well, but at the same time, um, whatever we can do to make sure that we can make things easier and better from the standpoint of offering some kind of graduation, we'll do that. But I think that's going to be predicated on the circumstances in terms of how this COVID-19 um, dissipates or, uh, and we certainly don't want this to happen, but if it obviously increases, we know we can't, we can't do that. We have to stay in the same pattern we're in now. Mm -hmm. But I, I would love to see uh, all of this go away and, and uh, we can just get back to normal. But um, I'm a spiritual person. I know everything's in God's hands and he's going to, um, it's going to end in his timetable and I, I'm just going to keep my faith. Mm -hmm. I know the kids would um, definitely love to hear and to know that they will be able to uh, walk across that stage. That's a, a, a great milestone for a lot of, yeah. a lot of people. You know, they work for 12 years getting to that one place <laughs> and for the disease to come in and take it away from them, you know, it's pretty sad. It, it, it is. And of course, um, in, in my lifetime, and I'm, I'm sure yours as well, um, this is the first time I've ever seen this happen. And this is just, um, just something that obviously we didn't expect, but at the same time, we're trying to work uh, to make sure it's it's in everybody's best interest that we do it the right way and most importantly keep everybody safe and that's that's the number one concern safety and 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 sparing lives saving lives and um we want to make sure that if we can offer those opportunities you can rest assured that if there's any way possible that that can be done it will be done in terms of walking across that stage or graduating or having some kind of ceremony um we'll we'll do it but the priority right now is to just make sure we um, just stay safe and make sure that we can get through this period of transition, hopefully with, um, without it getting worse than what it is. Awesome. You know, I uh, want to go back to uh, parents. My, we have, like I said, we have some nieces and I hear a lot of parents that say, mm -hmm. I feel like I have to go to school again just to help my kids with their homework. <laughs> so <laughs> what can you tell parents? Um, I remember um, trying to help my niece with some math and I learned it one way. So I was trying to teach her how to get to the answer the way that I had learned it. And yes. she was getting frustrated with me saying, Titi, that is not how you do it. <laughs> and I said, what do you mean? This is the answer. She said, no, I have to do the long, long term, a long way or something. And I'm like, why? This is the answer. <laughs> so what can you tell parents who are getting frustrated with trying to teach their kids these, uh, uh, the answers when you, they are totally different methods from when we were in school? That's, that's a very, very good point. And there are different challenges out there with parents um, either learning in a different way. And, and, and certainly, um, I, I know I wouldn't want to be in a position where I had to, 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 to teach because uh, I learned in a different way and so forth. And, and I don't want to frustrate myself nor the person that I'm trying to teach it to. Oh, yes. But at the same time, um, I think it's what I would say to parents is take this opportunity and just relish the opportunity to be with your children to participate in the learning process and to um, stay connected with obviously the classroom teacher and looking at the zoom and how things are going on because they can they can be involved in that as well in terms of uh, helping out when the teacher has that classroom setting with Zoom and is going through the lesson and so forth. Parents can be in on that, as well as I mentioned earlier, administrators can be in on that. So I would just say, take, just take this opportunity to keep them engaged, go to the websites, look at what's there in terms of the links that we have to the different resources and so forth. Uh, engage and educate yourself a little bit more as well in that respect and just try to be patient and, and know that we're all in this together. Mm -hmm. And we're going to get through it together. And um, I tell you, I don't, you, you, you may have a false, I guess, perception that maybe it's not as difficult for teachers and principals and, 
administrators and so forth, but trust me, they're working harder now than they would work in the school setting, in, in the normal school setting, because this is different and we have to have more accountability. And I, I think it's, it's, not, it's not a break for anybody. And it's, trust me, they're working hard. And I just want the parents to know that we, we love you, stay engaged, consider this an honor to work collaboratively with your teacher, your child, as well as yourself. And just know that um, we're going to get through the school year successfully. Uh, if your child has, as I mentioned earlier, passing grades in that third nine week period, um, promotion will be no problem, but we just wanna make sure that we do the assignments and the enrichment and the critical skills necessary for the children to be successful when they come back to school. You know, uh, Ms. Drake, we do have a literacy law out there now and um, it, it takes effect in uh, 2021 where all first graders, these current first graders in our school system and through the state have to be proficient in the third grade in terms of reading on or above grade level to go on to the fourth grade. There are exceptions with special ed uh, circumstances and things of that nature, but we just wanna make sure that um, we stay on par and we use every resource to make sure we help our children. Even the Alabama Public Television Network, they have a lot of things out there on TV and on their website where um, uh, you can you can look at that and, and gain some knowledge as well as our links on our website with the district and and um and we're not gonna hold parents uh at fault uh if you can't uh help your children like the teacher can of course but we just want you to be there to support and know that we're there to to make sure that we make sure your child is successful in any way he or she can be okay what you said i had a couple questions one is um so the new law about them not being able to grade, yes. move forward at at um in the third grade and then yes. the other question i have is is there a way that parents can talk to the teachers or communicate with the teachers if they have questions about some of the homework or the work absolutely. that the kids are doing absolutely um they they can they can speak with them um they can um when when they have those online sessions and so forth they can do that or if they want to if they want to call the principal and talk with the principal regarding getting connected with that they can do that as, as well too but particularly when children are in that setting when parents get the notifications and so forth of the work being uploaded the assignments and so forth and checking on chalkable the grades and so forth if they have any questions they can communicate via those platforms uh also um I think that it's, it's, it's very important, getting back to the literacy law, that they understand that this takes effect in 2021. Now, I don't know how much the pandemic will affect that because we have had an interrupted school year uh, pretty much, but uh, I'm sure uh, the state superintendent and, and the governor will come up with some, uh, they'll tell us about the changes if anything happens along those lines. But right now, that's the way it stands. So what you're saying is in 2021, if the first graders, they say, for instance, they were in the third grade, if they do not do not read third grade level, they will not be passed to the fourth grade. Absolutely. And, and with the stipulations being with, uh, there will be certain cases such as special ed students, and they'll look at all those parameters as well. But for the regular classroom teacher and the children and so forth, the regular students, that expectation is out there for them to be at or above grade level when they're in third grade. Of course, this year's first graders will be those that are first affected by that in 2021. What made the what made the grade be third grade? Generally, the research um, says that if you're not on or above reading in that particular grade, your chances for success or graduation. Uh, it's just very, very uh, limited in that regard. So they kind of use that grade as a benchmark and early learning, you obviously want to get started really early because we don't want children going into fourth and fifth grade or middle school or high school uh, behind in reading because you don't catch up. And so pretty much we want to get an early start and get them when they're at third grade and keep them on track and make sure that um, they're being very competitive, not only with students in Alabama, but throughout the world. So the No Child Left Behind Act is kind of out the window to a degree in reference. Yeah, that 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 was <laughs> that was back there when I think when I was 
superintendent and teaching and so forth, it's pretty much a different standard now. Um, the Literacy Act is, is pretty much the most current in that regard. And um, pretty much when you look at this state, not just Birmingham, but the state overall, reading and math, and particularly reading, uh, are the weak areas. Um, nationally, uh, the state did not do well in reading nor math. And so the state has put a special emphasis on that for all of our schools. And um, I think at one point we were maybe, um, can't remember exactly which one, but maybe 49th in reading or math or 51st or 50th in reading or math, one of those two. But wow. the bottom line is we're at the bottom in, in mm -hmm. statewide, according to the NAEP, which is a national uh, assessment for educational planning tests. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's, that measures reading and math and some other subjects as well for the United States. And we did not fare well there um, with the latest results that we got this year. And uh, we've sort of been dropping um, in the past few years. So the emphasis has been on reading and the emphasis has been on pre-K reading and now this literacy law, which came about probably as a result of those negative scores. Mm -hmm. So what can parents do to make sure that their child is uh, literate? Um, you know, they're even just using technology, like they don't mm -hmm. necessarily have to have a book, but help parents understand how they can help their kids out the gate begin to enter into uh, school education, primary education, um, top of their game, because it's nothing like being in the classroom and you don't know what the teacher is talking about and you're behind, right. you know, that's already messing with your mind. <laughs> that's that, right. I don't know. I don't know A from B or I don't know how to say cat or dog. You know, so how can the parents, we're spending so much money, they have cell phones, these kids have everything these days. So what can parents do to make sure that their children are on top, specifically in the state of Alabama? I think that parents can spend time um, reading with the children, uh, providing resources, um, utilizing the technology that we have in terms of looking at the different enrichment programs and, and, and resources online. I think uh, when, I was, when I was growing up, and I, uh, that was a long time ago, uh, I, can't, I can't tell you how I learned to read, Ms. Drake, but I know one thing. I used to have books to come to me in the mail, uh, and somehow um, this process started where I would always get these Dr. Seuss books coming to my home, and I started reading those, and that, 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 that really, I guess, propelled me to be the reader that I am today. And, and, and I just think that reading, reinforcing reading, and making sure that we take the time to, um, to provide the resources for our children early, um, talking to them, uh, studying with them, reinforcing the, the work that's done at school and so forth. We just have to do those kinds of things and put that quality time in and use those computers and laptops and iPads and telephones to, to get some enrichment media there as well as uh, entertainment media. And I think children, do you know as well as I do, they know more about technology than we know. And, and, and if you want to learn about technology, you go to the kids, they'll tell you. Mm -hmm. uh, some, some teachers today are afraid of technology, quite frankly, and some adults are. But the children are not. And they, they seem to take it to another level. So if they can do that there, they can do it with the academic or instructional aspect part of it, which is what we're trying to encourage. So I think um, it starts at home and, and without a doubt, and uh, we have the children for most of the day, of course, but at the same time, um, the reinforcement is necessary. We don't want the parents to take the mindset where they're yours during the day and uh, we just we just need a break or whatever the case may be. I'm not saying all parents do that, but at the same time, we're just avoiding that mindset. And when they come home, you want you're interested in what did you learn? Um, you know, we have platforms where you can actually go um, online and see what your children uh, are doing, grade wise, as well as what they have been taught and what they're learning and what the assignments are. You see that, so we can help with that in terms of reinforcing that as well. Well, Sometimes I can be a little loquacious, so bear with me. Oh, no, we love it. Um, so 
basically if they go to the Birmingham Board of Education's website, they can find a wealth of knowledge on how to ensure that their children are um, on task and on top of things. I think something key you said was um, when it becomes a priority in the house, priority to parents, important to parents, then it becomes important to the kids. And I, I hope that as parents are listening into this, that you're seeing that it's more than, you know, tennis shoes and just all the stuff that we make our kids think that are, that yes. those things are important. What's yeah. most important right now is education. I remember telling my kids right now, uh, up from, from kindergarten to 12th grade, your only assignment in life is to get your education. <laughs> I don't care if you never go outside and play. I don't care if you have any friends. I don't care. Not your most important assignment in life is to get your education and to do it well. So I think that, um, that as you continue to communicate that, hopefully parents will see the importance of it because all of our kids are bright. It's just the foundation that they begin to come out of yeah. what keeps them behind. Yes. So you can give them a strong foundation. They can work this thing. They, they can. And uh, I saw a statistic um, that um, stated something to the effect that um, India has more gifted children than America has children. And that's, a, that's an astounding uh, statistic because it, it shows you the dedication and the, I guess, more than anything else, the competition that our children are going to have uh, throughout the world. So I ran a school board with the understanding that we were going to first and foremost, serve our children and get them prepared to be the best, not only in Birmingham, mm -hmm. Jefferson County, Alabama, but nationally and globally. Yeah. That was my, that was my mission to serve the board, to make sure our children have that type of preparation. And you're absolutely right. We have so many smart, gifted children and we just have to make sure that we do our part as educators, as parents, and lead and guide them because they're only going to go as far as what we expect. And I tell people all the time that every child can learn. Mm -hmm. And that's not, I guess, basically what I'm saying is there's no excuse for any child failing. And we don't want children or teachers, educators to have the mindset that just because this child came from this environment, mm -hmm. he or she will not be successful. Right. We're trying to erase all of that because right. uh, all of our children are good and they're children of God and God didn't make any junk. He made talent and we all have gifts. And so we want to make sure we get the best out of our kids and we want to make sure we provide, provide the resources and we're going to provide them in the school system. And we want our parents to be on board there too, because so many times um, I know it made a big difference to me when I had to go to uh, participate in certain events as a child. If my parents were there, it made a difference. If they were not there, it, it just deflated me. Mm -hmm. But for the most part, they were there. And that makes a difference. So let's try to be at these events with our children, be supportive. And, and, and sometimes um, it's not right but sometimes if you're not as engaged or involved in coming to the schools, teachers have a tendency not to be as uh, stern on your children. They, you just, if they know you're going to be there, if they know that you're, they can depend on your support and they know that you're watching them, they are going to give 100%. Not saying all of them are like that, but sometimes you have a, a nature to let up if you see someone who doesn't have that, that engagement or involvement with the children. And um, we just want to make sure that our kids are not shortchanged in any arena or in any area. Yeah, and parents, you may um, be wondering why, what does it matter globally? Um, this pandemic should just show you that the world is small. <laughs> yes. Technology has made, has leveled the playing field. And, you know, it goes beyond the city that you're in. Your children are able to reach globally, internationally. 
um, there are no limits today. There really aren't any limits to us. And so just like there aren't any limits to our kids, there aren't any limits to the kids in India. Uh, they can also take jobs that are here in the United States because of their brightness and stay right there in India and where all of the money that they make is going in India, you know, and so we can't necessarily say because of our financial status that that's the reason why because a lot a lot of kids in India don't have as well you know this is just that's having lack sometimes it can be uh, globally it's just that's all right. over the place and so you just have to do what you need to do to go to, to the right people and say hey I need some help listen I don't understand this math uh, you know but I want to make sure that my kids get the best I want to make sure that they excel I didn't I got a GED. I'm not bright in this area, but that doesn't mean my kids don't have to be bright. So who do I need to talk to? What extra things do I need to do That's in right. order to make sure that my kids can compete? Because what they're saying actually is the jobs that you all are working, that we are working now as adults, they won't be here in another 10, you know, 10, 8, 10 years because of tech, the technological advances. So not only do you, you, your children need to be learning this, you need to as well. <laughs> you yep. need to step up your game because things are going to shift. And this pandemic is only showing us how it can and how it can do it fast because now what it's doing is forcing these things that they've been saying is going to happen in the future to happen now. So everybody is trying to rush to get this technology AI out into the world. And so if our kids don't know anything, they don't know three plus two, or they don't know how to spell C-A-T, then they're going to be out. They're going to be out and we don't want that. They're too bright. They have too much in store for them. And all they need is just your support you're pushing them and you're just saying to them, hey, you can do it. This is important. This is where your priorities need to be. A absolutely. And um, you 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 hit the nail right on the head. And I, I just think that it's important that um, in offering the opportunities that we have for our children. And as a school system, we're going to make sure that the technology aspect of it, uh, we're not going to lack there. They're going to have that opportunity to have those Chromebooks, they're gonna have an opportunity to advance in the technology world based on the fact that everybody's doing this. And I think that um, when I look at um, dual enrollment in the schools and so forth, give, giving our children the opportunity not only to learn what they need in terms of uh, the basics or the enrichment in their particular grades, but the opportunity to also achieve college credit or whatever they want to do in apprenticeships and things of that nature, all of that's out there. We have that. I have people tell me all the time, well, if my child's not good and, um, you know, going to college or whatever, you know, why don't the schools offer um, things such as uh, vocational education and so forth? Well, that's an old term, you know, it's career tech now. And we have all of those things now, thematic, uh, uh, programs in high schools, along with the career tech vocational ed programs where they can get those things in addition to the enrichment for uh, college and so forth. And it's just a wealth and a plethora of opportunities in our schools today. And we just want our parents to know that uh, you, you're welcome to visit, you're welcome to come and talk to your teachers and see how you can help be the best uh, assistant or partner you can be in this process because we're not just trying to do it all ourselves, by ourselves. We want your help, we need you. And uh, I, I know I grew up in, in a household where my father did not have a high school graduation, uh, degree rather, and, and my diploma, and my mother, uh, she graduated high school, of course, but their expectation, expectation level for me was graduate from high school. And um, if I got a job at that time at the plant and so forth, that would have been great, because that's what was, the big topic at that time in my lifetime, but I had a desire to go further. So what I'm saying to you, my parents now and everybody, have high expectations for our children. They can go anywhere they want, they can compete. And I can tell you right now firsthand, being in the schools, I see the talent that we have from speaking talents, the singing talents, all types of gifted avenues of our children. I see it. And I just, I feel blessed that I'm in a position to 
uh, enhance that at the school board level by providing the opportunities for them to get better. But we can't leave our parents out. And we have our partners coming in. I know we talked about that earlier to try to enhance in all areas where we can make sure our children get the opportunities in the high schools, in the middle schools, in the elementary schools, and so forth. And I, and I just think that it's important that our parents realize that Birmingham City Schools are, are working hard to make sure that we provide everything that we need for our children to be successful and be patient with us through this pandemic because COVID-19 has not been nice to a lot of us or any of us for that matter, but we have to make sure that we understand that we're in it together and it's a new journey for all of us and we're going to make it together. So how are the teachers adjusting, especially those teachers that are not that so good in technology? Well, that's, that's a good question. And um, I, I don't particularly know how each of them are adjusting from that standpoint or is adjusting from that standpoint, but I do know that um, it appears to me that from what I'm hearing, everybody is pretty much fine with the, uh, the digital aspect of what we're doing, the online aspect of what we're doing. And um, I don't hear any, I heard a couple of I guess <coughs> horror stories, if you will, when we had some packages at uh, one particular school that were not, it was not coordinated like it should have been, uh, whatever happened there. But um, that, that got corrected and that, that certainly has been much better. And from now, to this point, I'm seeing smooth sailing, hopefully, and I don't, I don't hear any complaints from the teachers. I know that um, they're working harder, as I said, Ms. Drake, before, and they're not working easier because they're out, because we are holding them accountable, and we want these, these teachers to understand, our teachers to understand, that um, the state superintendent's mandate about making sure that all the critical uh, areas and all the critical skills that must be covered and beyond are covered. And we're gonna make sure that that happens. And if it's more comfortable from a standpoint of a Zoom or just um, online teaching in whatever capacity they're comfortable with, that's fine with me and that's fine with us. But I don't think that we're having any major problems with teachers not adjusting to this from what I'm hearing at this juncture. Well, that's awesome. Um, our kids need our teachers. Um, and kudos to all the teachers. I know it may be for some a learning curve um, yes. <laughs> to get on and, and refigure this thing out as, and as well as your lesson plans and your formatting and all that now it's shifted and you got to come up with new creative ideas uh, to get this information out to the kids. But we appreciate you. Yes. But we just want to encourage you to continue on and we appreciate our parents um, for your wonderful kids and for you know, just stepping in and stepping up and where you need yes. to make some adjustments to do it better. We thank you for considering it um, so that our kids can have a bright future. Dr. Raglan, we okay. really appreciate you taking the time out to talk with us and to educate us, to inform us, to bring us up to date to what's going on uh, with the school system and how you all have arrived at these decisions and what we can expect in the future. Is there anything else you would like to leave with us? Yes, Mr. Drake, thank you so much um, for the opportunity to give an update on behalf of the school system. And I certainly uh, consider it a very tremendous honor to serve our children. <laughs> and we're working diligently on, on the behalf of our children to make sure that uh, each and every one of uh, our beautiful scholars has an opportunity to be successful at the highest level. Um, through this pandemic, we're obviously put in a position where we have to do things differently, but I like to just encourage our parents to uh, just stay patient with us and just embrace the opportunity to be with your children at home, to engage in this collaborative effort with us, the teachers, the principal, the school system in general, and, and know that uh, we will get through this together. Uh, I certainly uh, want you to know I will keep you informed and uh, I'll be available for any questions you may have as well. And we're going to make sure that the guidelines that come to us from the State Department of Education, from the Governor's Office, uh, whomever, the School Board Association, that we keep your prize and that we do what's in the best interest of uh, moving forward.
for this particular school year and beyond. Uh, at this juncture, our school year is going to end on the 5th. We're going to have plans for summer school programs, I'm sure. Um, that's going to come to light later down the road. But we'll keep you informed and just let you know that this is a great opportunity, unorthodox, but a great opportunity for us to work together and make sure that the common goal is achieved in our children's education, uh, educational success. And thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to serve. And again, I thank God for the opportunity to serve because without him, I would be nothing. And I'm just thanking him for all he's done for me. And I certainly will carry that spirit as I do my daily um, routine and works for our children and for our community. Thank you so much, Ms. Drake. You're welcome. We thank you for your uh, excellence and your commitment to our children and our community. You know, this can be crisis or it can be opportunity. And I believe that if we look at it from the right perspective, we will see great opportunities. There's opportunities to know those little ones that we say we know <laughs> and to get to know them a little better. Um, opportunities to, for those moments, uh, those precious moments that are fleeting and they don't last forever. So you can take, the, take this time to um, really build some great moments with your children and to impart some character take some time to impart some things that will go with them throughout yeah. life and more than anything to reaffirm your love for them and to let them know that you love them and that you are doing everything to keep them safe uh, during this time of uncertainty. Dr. Ragman, once again, thank you so much for taking thank the time you. out to talk with us on the Jocelyn Drake Show. And we will see you the next time on the Jocelyn Drake Show. Have a great day. Thank you. You too. And have a blessed day and stay safe. Same to you. Yes, ma'am.